Welcome to the first live class with an expert. Uh, today, we are going to talk about scoring triangle. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. Sherry Nabil Fanous, consultant of interventional pain medicine. And let me welcome my eminent guest, Professor Gabu Rex. Uh, Professor Rex is the founder and the past president of the World Institute of Pain. He is the Director Emirates of the American Society of Interventional Pain Physician. Uh, he is the holder of more than 100 international awards. Um, I, can't I can't know where to start actually. He has won several lifetime awards. Um, if you are going to start about the uh, Grover Murray Award, he was the first recipient of this uh, prestigious award. Uh, in 2004, uh, he won also uh, uh, a lifetime award by the American Society of Interventional Pain Physician. In 2012, another award, lifetime achievement by the New, New York and New Jersey Interventional Pain Physician. And the most recent one was in 2021 by the Texas Pain Society. Uh, we all know that he invented the revolutionary Rex catheter in 1982, which changed the course of interventional pain medicine. Uh, he is the guru and the godfather of pain medicine. Let me welcome my dear professor, Professor Gabu Rex. Welcome, my dear professor. Sherry, uh, it's, it's very nice of you to invite me. And it is an honor and a privilege and pleasure to accept your invitation. And I will try to explain something that came out of nowhere. I did not know about this. And it's, it's not easy to spread information. And uh, the, the basic theme is that the dura does move and it moves much more than the nerve roots. When you have patients that have radiating radi radiculopathy, uh, it doesn't have to move very much to cause pain because it scars down coming out through the epidural scarring and it moves a tiny tiny little bit because of the scar tissue and 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 the neural foramen gets uh, uh, smaller when you hyperextend the spine you see the facet slide over the other one and the neural foramen gets smaller and that, therefore patients that move uh, the spine and into flexion, then the facet slide and the neural foramen gets bigger. And when you have, now this already is a huge information if you have a patient that has post-procedure pain uh, from a transforamal injection or from an epidural injection. And what the thing to remember that what you must recommend to the patient that you injected anything and is followed by pain is flexion and in the neck, same, but flexion, rotation. And the neural foramen gets bigger and the fluid that puts pressure on the spinal cord blood supply, it escapes through the larger neural foramen. And similarly, when you have veins distended, big fat veins, um, there is no spare room. 
There is no extra room to in even a smallest volume. So that's where it is very helpful when you place a catheter, you can see and you drive the catheter that uh, it can uh, go, uh, let's see, that you thread from the sacral hiatus through a, a, a needle. Oh, by the way, the sacral hiatus uh, is a common way for anesthesiologists or pain doctors, but you use tend to use a bigger needle, like this is a 15 gauge needle. Oops. That's not. Um, I think this is a 15 gauge needle. You see how much bigger that is than the 18 gauge and the 21 gauge catheter. This is the, the newest thing and the uh, you place the curved RX two could a needle through the sacral hiatus to the area where you palpate the palpate the sacral cornua and it is the left index finger the left index finger comes from one side or the other one inch of midline two inch below on the gluteal mound and you pop it in and then you correct the angle and don't usually go all the way to the side but you go halfway between the midline and halfway uh, the lateral wall and then you take the stylet out and place the catheter that has a little bend and you, you direct the direction by bending the needle towards the side and you get it to the ventral epidural space. Now, normally, so you can get to the ventral epidural space by curving down and you are in the L5 area. Please do not go in the midline. The typical surgical approach, they just want to get it straight in and ram it in. And when you get to this area and you get stuck between the dura and the nerve root, you can pop into the subdural pain space. That's between the dura and the arachnoid. And that usually happens when you go midline. And when you inject anything there, you may end up compressing the available space and the blood supply to the spinal cord. So if you inject uh, contrast, in the epidural space, you will learn the epidurogram and you, if you inject into the subdural space, now that's a limited space. And if you inject hypertonic saline, tempest and sodium chloride, as you will hear me talk about, that is going to absorb fluid and if you are in a subdural space, there is not much space and the patient will complain of 
bilateral pain. And then what we do is place a, a needle in the midline into the subdural space that you recognize. And you will have to look at some of the articles that we published, how to deal with bilateral pain and it gets worse and it can end up compressing the blood supply to the conus. And in rare instances, in all my years, we've, when we did not know about uh, the effect of arachnoiditis, uh, if you get into the epidural or subdural space, you can compress the blood supply to the uh, uh, conus, the tip of the spinal cord, and you can end up with a bladder dysfunction and bladder injury. In all my years, in 89, we wrote a book and we described the first series in 1989. Uh, we had one denervated uh, bowel and bladder and a patient had to have a very rare, but it's published and you can find the first case published in that article in, in the title of the book is um, Techniques of Neurolysis and Gabor Ratz, I was the editor of it and it, that, that was and still haven't had another paralyzed or injured patient because it's very, very rare, but we learned that arachnoiditis, you are very careful that you do not do it and you deal with arachnoiditis differently. And that's the explanation that we have learned from, uh, it's usually people that they start out and uh, surgeon just ram it in quickly and compress the blood supply. But our purpose is to talk about the scarring triangle, but also you should learn the cases you should not attempt to do. And arachnoiditis is one of them because you, when you get in, you may get into the subdural space or in the arachnoiditis where the fluid does not spread out, it loculates and compresses blood supply. Now, the testing for arachnoiditis, for uh, the dural mobility came from an unexpected videotape where I was doing a patient a cervical uh, neuroplasty uh, that uh, is again the neural foramen gets bigger when you flex and rotate and we get into the cervical epidural space and unfortunately I don't have a uh, a model for the cervical uh, spine uh, but uh, next time I, I will. Um, it, and it, it is something that is important. And you can influence whether the catheter goes straight up by being in the midline, or when you are in the mid, midline and you direct the tip of the needle, it goes to the lateral epidural space. Now the problem is the curvature in the sacrum because when you get in here and, and the area that there is a curvature and it sends the catheter posterior epidural space <coughs> and the scarring triangle is over the disc 
above the disc and you cannot it forms such scar, firm scarring you cannot get out of the out of the sacral canal in epidural space uh, to the out of the, the sacrum it you run into obstacle and also when you have the scar formation above uh, you will be behind posterior to the problem the dura is the most painful structure in the spinal canal it's more painful uh, the in the ventral epidural space the uh, posterior longitudinal ligament this you have the ventral epidural ligament um, ventral ligament enter, anterior and a posterior which is in the epidural space where there is this dimple now in the cervical area i had a patient had three electrodes for atypical facial pain and these electrodes were there to stimulate the nucleus caudalis at C2 level. And the patient, if you stimulate the C2 level in the spinal canal with a spinal cord stimulator, um, you have stimulation covering the face. So when you have atypical facial pain, we place a couple of electrodes in the neck or dual four electrodes, a paddle electrodes, a surgeon goes from above C1, two, uh, and threads lower down at C2 level. And I was doing a neuroplasty up at C6. And during the neuroplasty, for the reason of enlarging the neural foramen uh, by the flexion, I do a chin to shoulder rotation, left, right, left, and what I could see in this patient, what surprised me that you were for the first time are learning about this, is that the dura moves. And I could see the dural mobility because the electrodes were stuck at the C2-3 area and, and lower down. And I am doing a cervical neuroplasty by threading a, a catheter into the C6 area. Oh, here is the electrode movement. You see, there's a lower electrode. You see the electrode moving almost a full thickness. And here is my electrode uh, doing a neuroplasty. And in order to, you see the flu, a contrast spreading out and not so much, although there's a little bit of spread on the right side, there's more spread on the left side. So when I could see the move, movement of the dura and you can see it moves tremendous amount. Compared to that, it's really amazing, but I am spreading out the fluid outside the spinal canal, and I have a catheter injecting on the left side. Patient is in the face down position, and you can see the neural foramina opening up, and I, that patient had pain relief on the left side for two and a half years. And I have a videotape of that patient because she came back all the way from Washington with pain on the opposite side. 
and I did the neuroplasty with local steroid hypertonic and two and a half years later, I had to go to the right side and that was about three years ago. So the left side, I didn't have to repeat for, for uh, five and a half years now. And the first ever published case from neuroplasty, when you go out to the neural foramen, the ventral epidural space, the first patient I had to do 22 years later because the pain re returned. And the scarring that I have in the first um, time we did it, it was exactly the same when we did it 22 years later. And 22 years later, that is published in the techniques of neurolysis. And if you have the first edition book, don't sell it because I have seen it on sale, a $50 book when we published it in 89. Now it's $1,800 on the, on the internet. So if you have a first edition, that's a collector's item. So it, it's uh, something that you protect and keep. But anyway, the, so when I realized that the patient told me the neuropathy was coming down in C6, so I went to C5 and opened it up and but what it surprised me was that the patient that later i saw uh, there's some movement around me here it distracts me uh, had a little 13 year old girl who had an injury that she didn't realize was admitted to the hospital with left-sided uh, T9 pain radiating just above the belly button. And I, we didn't know why, but when she went into the children's hospital, they took out her gallbladder because there's epigast, uh, there's pain on the right side. They thought it's maybe a variant. So that case is also published and you can see the test. And then I bent her forward and head bending it down because the dura is attached to the foramen magnum so when you bend the head down and you put the posterior longitudinal ligament in the epidural space on stretch, you bend the patient down and then you bend the head down. The bending of the head moves the dura, maybe 10, 13, 14 millimeters. That's, that's what you could see on my observation from the electrode when I was working on that C6 radiculopathy. And first I didn't notice because I was watching the dye trying to get out at C5, 6. And then it, to my amazement, I could see the electrodes stuck to the dura and and when we moved the head and neck to open up the neural foramen and the foramen or runoff, and you could see the dye coming out uh, on the left side more because we were there and the dye could not spread similarly to the other side. There was a little spread and you need to look at that video several times to understand what I'm trying to say, that you get the catheter to the nerve root in the ventral 
lateral epidural space that you want to help. Your epidural steroids are utterly useless. They don't do any good. And just think how many times you do it in the, in the neck, in the back, and anywhere, you know, because what obstructs the blood flow to the spine and fluid out from the spine is scar tissue obstruction of the available space and when i go up to the ventral lateral epidural space and inject contrast tiny amount first and then as i see runoff you also open up venous runoff in some patients we publish these you see big and gorged varicose veins in the epidural space. And blood in the epidural space is not the problem. The problem is blood under pressure. And when you poke a hole into the vein and it bleeds slowly, it looks innocent, just the venous bleed. It's not innocent because there's high pressure. Remember, they take a vein for arterial pressure when they used to do a lot of coronary artery bypass grafts, the blood supply of the heart. Those are just veins. And, but if you poke a hole in it, if you stick a needle into the vein, high pressure vein, it bleeds until the pressures are equal on the outside and the inside. And now that is above the mean capillary perfusion pressure to the spinal cord, and you get ischemia, you, and you get bladder dysfunction, you get paralysis uh, and injury, 